Twistum is late again. You have failed me for the last time, Stephavs. Wait, no, leave her now. The people need their science. I find your lack of punctuality disturbing. I'm really sorry, but I was in Star Talk and I got to meet Bill Nye and it was amazing. Wait, did you say Bill Nye? Ugh. Yeah, I got to meet Bill and Andy Weir, Dr. Jim Green, Maeve Higgins, Eugene Merman. They were all really cool people. Do you want to, like, grab some coffee and talk about it? Yeah, while well, I got you there, can we talk about that first Death Star design? I mean, really, who signs off on having an exhaust port that if you shoot just right down it, it blows up the entire thing? I signed off on that design. Oh. <sighs> Hey guys, welcome back to The Stemulus. I'm Steph Evs, and here's what happened this week in STEM, or last week in STEM. Who cares? Here's the really cool science. Our first story deals with one of the toughest known creatures in the universe. Now we're not talking about grizzly bears or great white sharks, or even that one kid that we all had in our third grade class that would eat anything on a dare and somehow not die. I wonder what Jerry's up to these days. No, no, we are talking about these little guys, tardigrades, AKA water bears. These microscopic little minions have been able to survive boiling and the vacuum of space. This week they are in the news for going full Han Solo and being revived after being frozen alive. Now, unlike Han, they were frozen in ice rather than carbonite. And also unlike Han, who was frozen only a year, these guys were frozen for 30 bleeping years. That's right, 3030. The year that these little guys were frozen, the most popular song with every breath you take by the police. Do you kids even know that there was a band named the police? I can't really rant too much. I missed the 80s by exactly four weeks, instead opting to be born on Super Bowl Sunday 1990, because I'm awesome like that. Our story starts back in November 1983, when scientists were collecting moss samples in Antarctica and discovered that one of these samples contained not one, but two tardigrades. Researchers managed to keep the tardigrades frozen at negative 20 degrees Celsius for the next 30 years until they decided to thaw them in 2014. To thaw them out, scientists put them in a warmer environment and then just watched and waited. Unfortunately, one of the tardigrades didn't fully revive, but the other one managed to come around by the end of the second week and make a full recovery. In fact, this tardigrade went on to lay 19 eggs, 14 of which hatched with no defects. So how do these little guys survive such extreme cold temperatures? Through a process called cryptobiosis. During this process, the tardigrades crank down their metabolic processes to 0.01% of their normal operating rate and shed all of their body's water. The tardigrades then replace the water shed from their bodies with a cushioning antifreeze gel made of a sugar called trehalose. Another thing that really helps tardigrades survive extreme conditions is their fantastic ability to repair their own DNA. These little beasts are so hardy that they give credence to the thought that life may exist not just in our galaxy, but in our own solar solar system even in extreme conditions. While we haven't found life yet, our solar system may have a newly discovered resident of the planetary variety. Move over Pluto, a new ninth planet may be in town. Researchers Mike Brown and Constantine Batigan of Caltech have discovered new strong evidence that a planet the size of Neptune may be orbiting the sun in the far reaches of our solar system. Now if the name Mike Brown is ringing a bell and the planetary science is part of your brain, it's for a good reason. But our good buddy Mike is more well known for killing planets than for discovering them. He was one of the main villains in the Pluto demotion saga. His discovery of Eris, a dwarf planet approximately the same size as Pluto, played a large part in the planet its reclassification. And this dude isn't even sorry. He wrote a book called How I Killed Pluto and this is his actual Twitter handle. We get it bro, you're happy you killed off part of my childhood. Chill out. So let's talk about this planet. Like I said, it's approximately the size of Neptune, which means it is almost 10 times the mass of Earth. Its orbital period is somewhere between 10 and 20,000 years, and at its closest point to the sun in its orbit, known as perihelion, it is still 200 astronomical units, or AUs, out. One astronomical unit is equivalent to the distance from the sun to the earth because humanity is so vain that we created a unit of measurement from the sun to us. To put that super vain measurement in numbers, one astronomical unit is equivalent to about 150 million kilometers. Even at its closest point to the sun, the planet is still seven times farther out than Neptune, and its orbit may carry it anywhere from 600 to 1200 astronomical units out, well beyond the Kuiper belt. So how did we even find this planet? Well, it all started back in 2003 when Mike Brown discovered Sedna, another dwarf planet. At the time, Sedna was the most distant known object in our solar system. Its orbit implied that something beyond Neptune had pulled it all the way out there though. But what? Brown also noticed several clusters of objects in the Kuiper belt that could not have been coincidental. The clustering of these other objects implied that a large body's gravitational force was at play. 
So the biggest question astronomers have is how did this planet even get all the way out there? It clearly didn't form there. One theory is that during the solar system's infancy, when it was a little baby solar system about four and a half billion years ago, this planet was basically knocked out of the planet forming zone near the sun, slowed down by gases, and eventually settled into its elliptical orbit way out there. Now there are still some skeptics in the community, and the only way to actually truly settle this is to find the thing, and that's exactly what they're trying to do. But rather than using your standard telescope, which can only search through a teeny tiny little bit of space at a time, which is essentially like looking for a needle in a haystack, the science Scientists have enlisted the help of Japan's Subaru telescope in Hawaii. Even with this telescope, it will still take the researchers five years to sweep the areas of sky that this planet is most likely hiding out in. You can run Planet X, but you can't hide. Our final story of the week deals with a crushing blow to comic book fans everywhere. This week, researchers at the University of Cambridge crushed the dreams of Marvel fans everywhere by definitively declaring that Spider-Man cannot naturally exist. Oh darn, I had my hopes up. So what evidence crushed our web-slinging friend? Well, according to these researchers, when you're talking about animals that are able to climb smooth surfaces, such as walls, the amount of surface area required for adhesive pads grows very quickly as the size of the animal increases. The average human would have to have 40% of their body covered with adhesive pads in order to be able to climb a wall. Or if you're just talking about feet, the human would have to have a size 114 in United States sizes or about a 145 in European sizes. That's one goofy looking Spider-Man. You know what they say, if he's got big feet, he can probably climb walls like Spider-Man. You have probably dated Spider-Man. Good job, gold star for you. Hopefully it was like Andrew Garfield Spider-Man and not Tobey Maguire Spider-Man. We don't talk about the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man. So what are the largest creatures capable of climbing walls with adhesive sticky pads? Geckos. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have mites, which are also capable of climbing walls, but they require 200 times less surface area for their adhesive pads than geckos do. Like I said, as the size of the animal goes up, the amount of surface area required goes up way faster. One thing that gets the scientists really, really stoked is that despite their very different evolutionary histories, different species from insects to tree frogs have developed this same adhesive pad trait. This is known as convergent evolution. What about larger animals? Some of them climb trees. Well, yeah, some large animals are able to climb, but they've had to develop different traits, such as claws or grippy toes. While I don't do much climbing myself, I know that my grippy toes are very handy for picking up laundry up off the floor. Now there is some hope for Spidey. He could just have to come up with some really, really, really extra sticky sticky pads like some tree frogs do, but it might be kind of hard to pull it off the wall after a while. I don't know how sticky it would have to be, but probably pretty sticky. But even if he can't exist, is that really so bad? I mean, do we really want to take a chance of this ever happening again? That third movie, man, we all know it happened, but no one likes to talk about it. So that brings us to our question of the day. If you could have any superpower, be it scientifically accurate or not, what would it be and why? Let me know in the comments section down below. As always, if you wanna check out any of the stories I covered a little bit more in depth, I will include links to my sources down below along with links to all of my social media. So please feel free to check that out in your free time. If you like this video and you wanna see more sciencey stuff just like it, please feel free to give the video a big thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. I'm putting out videos every week to talk about the latest and greatest in STEM news. I know it's Wednesday, but as always, if you find any really cool STEM related news stories throughout the week, please feel free to send them to me on Twitter at at 43 using the hashtag twist them and they just might wind up in next week's episode. And yes, there will be an episode this weekend. I will make it happen. I promise. I'm trying so hard to get back on schedule. Thank you guys from the bottom of my heart for sticking with me. It's been a crazy couple of weeks and I really, really appreciate your understanding. But with that, that's all I have. I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your week. Stay well, stay awesome, and I will see you next time. Fourteen of which hatched perfectly, 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 blooper reel. It didn't fully revive, but the other one managed to become blah, 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 blah. I've seen it with a sugar called tree hellos, tree hellos. The tardigrades then replaced the water. Blah, 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 blah. Where do you speak them? Antifreeze gel. Another thing that really helps tardigrades survive, 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 while new life has a Loki no bark! You haven't barked, now you're gonna bark. Stop! While new life hasn't been discovered, under yet yet Bill. Researchers Mike Ground at Mike Ground. 
It is so, his name is so easy. I mean Mike Bell is ringing a bell. Mike Bell, his name is Mike Brown. Mike, I'm really sorry if you're watching this because I have just messed up your name and it's the easiest name in this entire thing. But your name, for some reason, is the one I'm gonna screw up today. There's a bug in my, no, no, don't get it. Mike played a key role in the Pluto demo demotion. It's de not demolition, nobody demolished Pluto. In my heart, you did. You gotta watch it in my heart.